Coronation Day across the world. As dawn swept across the world today, it found everywhere the Commonwealth peoples and their friends preparing to celebrate. All day long, those celebrations have been going on. Now night has fallen over half the world, and night is falling here in London. Soon, Coronation Day will be over. But meantime, the celebrations of an apparently tireless people are building up to a climax. A climax in which, all the way round the world, they are waiting to greet the Queen. The Queen who is in their thoughts and in their hearts. We tonight are going round the world to listen to those celebrations and greetings. But before we set out, we return for a few quiet minutes to the very focal point of all, to Westminster Abbey. Over to Richard Dimbleby in Westminster Abbey. They say that a beautiful picture is worthy of the finest frame. The coronation service could have had no finer setting than that of this Church of Kings, marked and worn by 900 years of service to God. Such splendor we saw here where I now stand, such richness of color and harmony of music. And from it all, in the silence and the loneliness of the Coronation Theater late tonight, I can take three particular memories. How small and young the Queen looked as she walked alone from St. Edward's chair to place her jeweled sword on the altar. How tenderly, in such a fatherly way, the Bishop of Durham, whom the tradition of centuries demands should stand at the Queen's right hand, watched her as she performed this most exacting ceremony. He seemed to be on the point, always, of uttering some word of encouragement, though none, in fact, was needed. And I have another memory that I shall cherish, of a little boy in white shirt and shorts, who held tightly the edge of the royal box and gazed in wonder at his mother, the mother who played and joked with him every day, arrayed in all her majesty upon the throne, suddenly become a figure of history and wearing a real crown. Tonight, with everyone gone and not a sound about me, it is the setting of the coronation so clearly revealed that warms and cheers this old abbey. The royal blue, the silver and gold, the crimson throne, the lovely chair of King Edward, scratched and carved and defaced by the vandals of five centuries. It is all beautiful. But soon, as they turn out the lights, it will fade into the darkness, and there will remain only the superb pillars, the vaulted roof, and the sleeping figures of the abbey, imperishable, hallowed, and very close to God. Now from the abbey, from a deep pool of silence, to the torrent of enthusiasm and loyalty of the crowds outside Buckingham Palace, crowds waiting with great affection and in the highest of spirits for a sight of Her Majesty. Time and again, since the days of the Queen's great-grandfather, King Edward VII, the crowds have gathered at the gates of Buckingham Palace in time of sadness, in time of doubt, and in time of rejoicing. The crowds are there again tonight to rejoice. And we are going to join them. So over to Winford Vaughan Thomas outside Buckingham Palace. Right, right. Now you're happy, are you?
Buckingham Palace is at the centre of our thoughts tonight, but all over the world there are gatherings which, like the crowds before the palace, speak of that feeling of cheerful community which is so strongly abroad tonight. On our tour of the world, we will be visiting nearly 50 of these gatherings in all five continents. The nearest is within a few thousand yards of Buckingham Palace itself and the most remote over 11,000 miles away. We start our tour by crossing the Thames to Camberwell, over to Brian Johnson. And here at Camberwell, we've got a street party going now strong, and they're going to sing Bunch of Coconuts in the best style of Camberwell. So off we go. And they're dining up in a line right across the street here, which is decorated flags all over the place. And we've got a large crown over the top, a small stage erected in the street. And this whole Camberwell, well, you can have your Regent Streets and Oxford Street. This is decorations like real, true southeast Londoners. And they're having the time of their lives in spite of a bit of wind and rain here. And they're crowding this street. And I'm going to join in with them as they go arm in arm. So let's go over now and join in the dance. in song to our Queen. So here we go with good luck, good health, God bless you. From the packed and dusty streets of London to the coloured counties in the heart of England, to the orchards of the Valley of Evesham and the green Cotswold Hills. There in the English countryside festivities are also going on, festivities of a different kind in a different setting. To the Cotswolds to hear from George Hart. To the Cotswolds, it's a wild night as a gale sweeps across the pattern of fields and hedges below me, and low clouds are driven across the darkening sky. When it gets dark in an hour or so, large bonfires will be lit on the hilltops, on Main Hill and Dover's Hill, on the Broadway Hill here beside me, on Breeden Hill and the Worcestershire Beacon. The whole country will blaze its jollifications into the night. The villages down in the vale look quiet below the storm, but they aren't as quiet as they look. Festivities have been planned for months and are now in full swing, with sports and feasts and dancing on the village green. At Honeybourne, three or four miles from here, they're roasting an ox. Now that's a good old custom from the days of Merry England, in the time of Good Queen Bess. So let's go over to Honeybourne to hear from Godfrey Paisley. Yes, <laughs> and it's a, it's a real jolly party here at Honeybourne. The weather's not been too bad, 
and uh, they've had uh, all their pram races. The children have had fun in their tea, but the main centre of attraction has been uh, around the ox that's roasting, and here we are, all of us standing around this skeleton at this moment. Have you had a good, have you had a good trade with it? Yes, we've had a wonderful trade. We could do with another ox now. Have you enjoyed it? Well, there you are. They're full of it, absolutely full of the roast beef of old England. And what? What we eat? Now we move west from the Cotswolds, the heart of England, across the valley of the Severn to Wales. From the age-old English countryside, almost unchanged for centuries, to the newest and biggest steelworks in Britain at Margham, Port Talbot, to hear from a man who works there, Gerwin Thomas. I am standing on the shore of the Bristol Channel, looking towards the green hills of Glamorgan and historic Margham Abbey. Even tonight, liquid steel is still flowing out of the furnaces nearby. But as many of us as possible are taking time off with our families, my wife and my two children are somewhere in the vast crowd. I want you to know that we've had a wonderful day. We watched the coronation on TV. The children had tea and sports and a talent competition. There's been a concert party and a display by Cliff Curvis, the Welsh boxer. And now there's dancing. We shan't stop until one in the morning. Before the Royal Triorchy male voice choir greet you in song, may I say a word or two in Welsh? Kovion Karedig i Bob Kamro Achamrai Sin Grando, Pale Banag Abont, Adiu Gadwar Inas. Greetings to every Welshman and Welshwoman listening, wherever they may be. God save the Queen. <laughs> The words of that march were written by David Lloyd George. Now from Wales we head north to England's ancient cathedral city of York. Inside the city walls sits the great minster whose bells are ringing out today as they have rung on great occasions good and bad since the days of the curfew. Over to Philip Robinson at York. And I'm looking along Stonegate, a narrow street made narrow by the overhanging gables of the old buildings. Tudor shops and houses. The one next door I can see is dated 1434, before Columbus was even born. Elizabethan, Jacobean buildings. There's an inn with its sign on a beam straddling right across the road. And further along, I can see the graceful bow windows of Georgian shops. Behind it all, sharp-edged against the sky, are the turrets and pinnacles of the minster, whose bells you can hear. The street is gay with decorations, and one can't help thinking of all the coronation days of the past that have been celebrated here, even before the beginnings of English history. Wasn't Constantine the Great proclaimed Emperor of Rome here? Why, this very street was the Via Pretoria along which he must have been driven in his chariot. Centuries later, it was called the Stone Gate, when stone to build the minster was brought along it. York Minster, one of the glories of the world. Listen to the bells ringing a coronation peal. Now, from York, from the county of the White Rose, 
to the Red Rose of Lancaster. On to the great port of Liverpool. Now, whatever ship you sail in, whatever harbour you put into, you're sure to hear English spoken with a Liverpool accent. Maybe from the bridge of some elegant liner, or over the rail of a dirty British coaster with a salt cake smokestack. But you'll recognise that accent as the hallmark of some of the finest seamen of the world. Tonight, their ships are crowding the river from the huge grey mass of Her Majesty's cruiser Sheffield to little ships. Little ships with names like Iris and Daffodil. So, as our second tribute in sound from the north of England, let's take a salute from the ships in Liverpool's river. From Merseyside, we cross the Irish Sea to Northern Ireland. The seaside town of Bangor is holding high carnival tonight. Here is Harry McMullen at Bangor on Belfast Loch. Tonight in Bangor County Down, a great crowd of Her Majesty's subjects are celebrating by the sea. Very much by the sea, for the spray is blowing, blowing across the big open space here, for the roar of the waves has been mingling with the music and the singing. It's a fine night in Bangor, a bit blowy and a bit cold, but the sun's been shining here in Northern Ireland all day, and the people of Bangor aren't going to let a little thing like a cold wind worry them. All the banks round this great space are crowded, predominating colours red, white and blue, as indeed these are the colours in every town in this country tonight. We've had a pretty quiet day on the whole. The new-to-us service of television and the broadcast kept many people indoors, but tonight things are different. Lights, music, and out there in the bay, Her Majesty's frigate Venus, bobbing to the surge of the waves. We've been having square dancing and a concert by a genuine Ulster flute band, a sound familiar to Ulstermen wherever they may be. Listen to them marching off. That sound will bring back many memories in the far-flung parts of the world. And now, in the last rays of the setting sun, the people of Bangor gathered here on this coronation night are going to put their feelings into song. This is the last part of the Irish concert. Northeast now to Scotland, to Ben Nevis, highest point of the British Isles, where the provost of Fort William is waiting to light a beacon. This is the first of 10,000 beacons and bonfires which will blaze tonight across the summer sky of Britain. Four centuries ago, beacons warned the subjects of the first Elizabeth that peril was at hand. Tonight, the beacons signal a message to the subjects of the second Elizabeth, a message of good news and good cheer. Over to Robert Dunnett on the top of Ben Nevis. We have climbed beyond the clouds. We've passed from summer by the Highland Loch to winter on the roof of Scotland. We stand on five feet of snow. Uh, a blizzard, not a very strong one, but still a blizzard, blows across the roof. And here, actually, as the Queen was speaking, we heard the broadcast and the provost lit the bonfire which blazes merrily into the night. Well, maybe up here in the snow, our teeth are chattering a little bit, but that's nothing to talk about on the day when we've heard the news of the conquest of Everest amid so many other great events. No, what we express here is the warmth that Scottish people everywhere feel today, and the warmth that will be expressed by the Provost of Fort William, Mr. John Carmichael, in his message. To Your Majesty from the Highlands, 
Your loyal subjects humbly offer their heartfelt wishes and deepest homage. Here, amidst a jumbled sea of peaks, over 4,000 feet above sea level, we feel utterly removed from the hurly-burly of everyday life. We have surmounted the barrier of things material, and a great spiritual calm invests us, so that it is good for us to be here. It is our humble prayer that this profound peace may encompass you. May it be the prop and mainstay of your home, the guiding spirit of your counsellors, and through God's grace, your gift and legacy to the world. And now, to express that thought in the ancient language of the Highlands, Ashinakui to Aramorach, Aunankaint to Usta Natuka, Shi Aviskopuan Rishel Shevnambeon, Avastona Vias Eristeja Er Punet Nakluis. And that in English, the translation of the Gaelic means, May Your Majesty be blessed with peace as lasting as the mountain mist and happiness as well founded as the everlasting hills. And so, from the summit of Ben Nevis, we send that message, and another message from Scotland comes from the, on the bagpipes, and pipers wait now high on the ramparts of Edinburgh Castle to offer their tribute. Now, from the northernmost point of our tour of the British Isles, we come south through the whole of Scotland and England and over the sea to the Channel Islands to Jersey. Here, the Queen is the successor to the title brought to the Crown of England by William the Conqueror, Duchess of Normandy. Over to Jersey. This is Frank Gillard. Earlier today, I was outside Westminster Abbey. And tonight, over here on the other side of the English Channel, in the oldest overseas possessions of the British Crown, I find the coronation rejoicings at their height, rejoicings of subjects who loyally acclaim the Queen, not only as their sovereign lady, but also as the one who in her own royal right holds their ancient dukedom. And here from the People's Park in Jersey are two loyal messages of greeting. The first one from Fred Noyan. I'm a Guernsey fisherman. I spend my days on the waters around these islands. Guernsey, Alderney, Sark. Often I'm within sight of France. And we are true subjects of the Brit British Empire. And today these islands rejoice because our Queen has come to her coronation. As a Guernseyman, I say with humble duty, God bless your majesty. And now a Jerseyman, a young farmer named Pico. In Jersey earlier today, we were joined to Westminster Abbey by radio, and we felt very close to your majesty. And now as night falls, coronation celebrations are going on all over our island. And from the heart of these rejoicings, I salute your majesty in our ancient language. Des îles normandes loyales, j'en viens nos salutations les plus sincères à votre majesté. Une longue vie à notre duchesse. Dieu sauve la reine. And by their chairs, by their chairs, this great crowd in Jersey who heard that salutation endorse it with acclamation. And now we take you back a hundred miles northwest across the English Channel to join for a moment the crowds on Plymouth Hoe and to hear from Patrick Beach. Oh, 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 
In the center of the hoe stands the statue of Sir Francis Drake gazing to the horizon beyond Plymouth Sound. And I'm standing up here on the plinth beside him, rather to the amusement of the crowd. And below me, the quarter mile of promenade is a solid mass of people, dotted everywhere with red, white and blue, coronation favors on the girls, scarlet and navy of the Royal Marines, and the gleaming round white circles of the sailors' caps. The hoe is full of Plymouth traditions. For a few yards away, Drake played the historic game of bowls. Across the sound before me, the Mayflower sailed out to the unknown west, and here to Devonport, the Amethyst sailed home. During the blitzes, when all their halls were bombed, the people of Plymouth defiantly came up here to dance in the open air. And they gathered here to celebrate B night and BJ night. And once again, they've come here in their thousands to celebrate another great occasion. A whole city expressing its joy and happiness in dance and song. So as all over Britain the tide of celebration continues to rise, we turn overseas. But first we have just heard that the Queen is about to come out onto the balcony of the palace to give the signal that will start a pageant of floodlighting all over London and far beyond. So over again to Winford Vaughan Thomas outside Buckingham Palace. And this time I can really report I am here. I struggled when you first called me, but I was caught in the great enthusiastic mass of the crowd. Thousands and thousands of people had poured down the mall, had struggled to get near Buckingham Palace. I was struggling at the same time to get on the Victoria Memorial, and quite frankly, I was just hoisted high on the shoulders of the crowd, and it was hopeless. I heard you cure, I, I, I heard you call me, I sighed with despair, the crowd cheered, and I struggled back defeated. Our engineers have come to my rescue, they've rigged me up with a chair, a soapbox, and here I stand, like so many other thousands of Londoners and people from all over Britain who flocked in front of the palace tonight on the edge of the crowd looking towards the palace some of them using little mirrors to reflect the balcony towards them others periscopes and I luckier than them all I'm standing on my soapbox I can see right clear over their heads and there before me is Buckingham Palace a dramatic and exciting view too all through today, I've been looking at it. I've seen the pageants pass by. I saw the first royal appearance on the balcony. But now, somehow, it's assumed a new exciting quality. The whole of the palace, but for an odd window or two, is in darkness. But that central structure where the balcony, the famous balcony stands, is illuminated. The two great pillars stand nobly illuminated in the light. And I look towards them over an absolute sea of heads. Believe you me, everybody in London who can walk, drive and struggle has arrived in front of the palace. The announcement has been made and you can count the people here in thousands upon thousands. Not only here, but I've seen for myself, I've struggled among them. They stretch the whole way back, right up the mall towards Ambrose Arch. It seems to me that as long as they can see the palace, the roof of the palace, that's enough. They're here on a dramatic and historic moment. And it's a gay and excited crowd. Believe you me, most of them have been soaked for most of the day. It doesn't matter. That's the exciting thing about today's crowd. Yes, Everest has been climbed, but believe you me, a greater uh, feat of endurance has been performed by most of the people who st stood out all night to survive the deluges of the day and yet cheered Her Majesty the Queen in, in, in the Abbey and cheered her on her way back to her own home care in Buckingham Palace. Now I'm in the middle of them and a wonderful variety of people they are. Some gentlemen, gay as and, and excited, illuminated balloons. There's one in, flying in front of me, red, white, and blue. Uh, others, they're dressed in anything they can get hold of. They've changed their clothes, or some have just let them be. Doesn't matter how they're dressed, they've assembled tonight in front of the palace. And now we look towards that magic balcony. It is already illuminated. The crowds start cheering. We wait for the moment when we will see her come out and stand in between those two great, enormous classical pillars that almost dwarf the two dramatic figures of Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. 
Don't worry, the crowd are cheering, but they're not there. Now they do come. They've seen them. They've come out. The doors have been thrown wide. And there they see those two wonderfully exciting central figures of all our emotion today. Her Majesty the Queen still in that lovely coronation robe in which he rode back from the Abbey and the Duke of Edinburgh in his uniform of Admiral of the Fleet. Just two simple figures silhouetted standing out against those two enormous pillars that dwarf the balcony. They lift their hands, we cheer, we roar our acclaim. Listen. And as they stand there, Her Majesty presses that button which starts the whole of the London illuminations. A strange, dramatic, exciting sight. She gives the signal and along the mall the light runs, lifting up those arches, those coronation arches that have leapt right across this wonderful coronation way of London, so lightly, so airily. Now they seem to rise right above the crowd, above the, the earth, Against the sky, there they are, glorious airy traceries of light. The Duke of York's column is let up, Nelson's column is let up, and that's the signal. All over London, eyes are watching as Nelson's column rises in a glorious cylinder of light. They press the signals, and every building in London, dare I say it, the whole of London, is lit up. At places all over Europe, people have been listening with us today, and many have been watching too. Now we're going to some of those places, beginning in another floodlit capital. Over to Alan Adair in Paris. Thank you, London, and this is Alan Adair welcome you to Paris. Well, we're in a small bar, and it's very cosy, and we're amongst a lot of friends. At the piano is Alan Romance. The songs that you can hear, they're the songs of Paris. Now, this is very much a French viewpoint, so I'm handing you over to a young French woman who will tell you something of the picture. Solange Place. Well, we are celebrating the end of Coronation Day from the very heart of the capital. Incidentally, though we have no bonfires, a great number of our buildings have just been lit up too. Here at Mary's Bar, a stone's throw from the Champs-Élysées, there are about 25 of us gathered around the piano to drink a last toast to Her Majesty. And all over Paris, much the same thing is happening. The one topic of conversation today has been La Petite Princesse qui est devenue reine aujourd'hui. It has been very moving. You see, many, many Parisians remember the last time they saw and welcomed the little princess as she was then to their city. It's been like a public holiday. Thousands watching the television from London, listening to the radio. The special editions of the papers have been snatched like hot cakes by the car. Shops and buildings have been decorated. Giant colored photos of the Queen, pictures of the royal family, and British flags and emblems are everywhere. You in Britain, you have had a busy day. You have crowned a sovereign, and during all this, you participated in your joy. Now, at the end of this modest fairy tale, may we, with raised glasses, give you a toast deeply felt and sincere. Vive la reine! God save the queen! In Holland, too, they watched the ceremonies, and tonight they are also celebrating. Over now to The Hague to hear from Rink Edenborg in the House of Lords. Yes, we are in the House of Lords. But as you will understand, it has nothing to do with the Houses of Parliament, either British or Dutch. The House of Lords is a cafe in The Hague well known to many British visitors. And as you can hear, they are singing a song which you know well, and which we certainly know very well in this land of bicycles. The Dutch have shown a great interest in what happened in London today. Television was watched by a great many people, 
including cabinet members. The president of the second chamber at the opening of the debate today made a speech in which he expressed the sympathy of the house. But the interest shown all over Holland doesn't stop today. Tomorrow in the town of Utrecht, a special coronation week will start. Well-known shopping streets will then carry famous names like Regent Street and Piccadilly. A small Utrecht park, the Lucas Bolwerk, will be called Hyde Park. And for that matter, the soapboxes will be there as well. Now, to conclude, here is Miss Angelina Verbruggen, one of the party in the House of Lords in The Hague, with a message of greeting from all the Dutch people present. We in Holland, while greeting the British on this unforgettable day, feel you may be more kind to you than any other people outside of the common world. You share with us now the privilege of having a queen, and we understand from our own experience how warm your feelings are towards your lovely queen. And we are happy with you. Our friends in Scandinavia have been rejoicing with us too. Let's go first to Copenhagen. Over to Copenhagen. Well, from Copenhagen, we'll try Oslo in Norway, where a children's party and pageant has been going on at the British Embassy. We brought our microphone along to the garden of the British Embassy here in Oslo, where Her Majesty's Ambassador is giving an open-air reception for the British residents and their Norwegian friends. There must be around about a thousand people present, not counting all the children, who are having the time of their lives. And their costumes are a joy to see. Here's one of them right now. Hello, young man. Hello. Uh, what's your name? Where are you off to? I'm Barry Geddes, playing Toast to Men, sir. I've been in the London Cry Tableau. It's great fun. Good. And what else has been happening? Oh, there's been Scottish reels, tableaus, and mimes. Oh, and a cake as big as the Christmas tree, no it's in such a Fulgur Square. It's got the Queen's golden coach and a crown on the top. And there's going to be uh, fireworks later in the, when it gets darker. Uh, are your friends having fun, then? Or rather, of course, we wanted to be in London to see the Queen in the procession, but we've been learning about the coronation in Westminster Abbey and everything. But look, young man, there are millions of people listening to you now, you know. Uh, what would you like to say to them? Oh, long live the Queen, of course, sir. Good for you. And now we'll try Copenhagen again for His Excellency the British Ambassador over to Copenhagen. Outside the British Commonwealth, no country more friendly to our Queen and the British people than Denmark. The Canadian community in Denmark <coughs> has participated <coughs> fully in today's celebrations and joins with me in sending warmest greetings to our Queen, <coughs> our country, and to all citizens of the Commonwealth. <coughs> Vive la Reine! As a finale, very shortly, I will propose the toast of Her Majesty to a large gathering of British residents and their Danish friends at the famous Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen. You will hear their music now. From Scandinavia, we move eastwards to the British forces in Germany. The BBC television signal has been successfully transmitted 900 miles across Europe from London as far as Berlin. Let's hear from one televiewer in Berlin. This is John Crawley in Berlin. I have in the studio here in Berlin a lady who's on a visit to the city and she saw the coronation television from London this morning. Now I'm going to ask her to tell you about it. Uh, first, perhaps, you'd say um, where you saw it. I saw it in a room in which there were more German than English people, and everybody was tremendously thrilled by it. And what did you feel about it yourself? Well, I was very disappointed not to be in London for the coronation, but I was quite amazed how this programme brought London to Berlin. At first, it wasn't very clear, but when we saw the Queen driving the state coach, it became quite clear, and she seemed to be smiling straight at us. And did the pictures stay clear after that? 
No, there were several breaks, but we clearly saw Princess Margaret take her place, and we saw the Queen Mother arrive, and also a clear picture of Sir Winston Churchill in the robes of the Order of the Garter. Then what about the ceremony itself? That was clear nearly all the time, and it was most moving. We saw and heard the Archbishop of Canterbury presenting the Queen to the people, and then the robing and the anointing and the crowning itself. We saw all that, and it was quite wonderful to see. Is there anything else that uh, struck you particularly? Yes, the beautiful way the Queen held herself and her graceful arm movements. And a very charming picture of Prince Charles with the Queen Mother. But my main feeling was one of wonder at being able to see the coronation almost as well as if I had been in London. And that came uh, over 900 miles over a series of um, relay stations. And although there was some blurring, it was really quite remarkable to see. Well, thank you very much indeed. Our last call in Europe comes from Greece, from the beautiful island of Corfu, whose people have a very special interest in today. I am speaking to you from one of the most beautiful islands of Greece, from the island of Corfu. During the past 150 years, Greece has achieved many close ties of friendship and common purpose with Great Britain. The happy occasion of the coronation of your queen leads our thoughts here in Corfu back to an event that took place one June day very nearly 32 years ago. That event was the birth on Corfu Island of Prince Philip, now the royal consort of your Queen Elizabeth. It is a great honor and sincere personal pleasure for me to address to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth on behalf of the people of Corfu Greetings and profound good wishes on the happy occasion of Her Majesty's coronation. I also extend the good wishes of this town to the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's consort, whose godfather I am by virtue of my office as Mayor of Corfu. Now we leave Europe to hear from overseas, from kinsmen in the vast Commonwealth of Nations who have been celebrating today. Ever since early this morning, reports and recordings have been pouring into London from the furthest parts of the world. For the last 16 hours at Broadcasting House in London, we have been keeping open house by shortwave radio to all these reactions and rejoicings. And now tonight we are able to give you glimpses of the most varied and colourful blend of celebration ever received in London. These are but moments from the worldwide panorama of rejoicing, but they show a little of the joy and loyalty with which the peoples of the Commonwealth greeted the Queen on her coronation day. Let's start in the Mediterranean, at Malta, the George Cross Island. Yesterday evening, thousands of Maltese schoolchildren marched down Kingsway to the palace for a pageant. While it was going on, His Excellency, the officer administering the government, was recorded by John Colley making this welcome announcement. Hello, children and young people. I don't want to make a speech, but I thought you would like to know that the Honourable Minister of Education has just agreed that in celebration of this great event, Wednesday shall be a holiday. Main Street, the centre for the Royal Navy ashore, was almost deserted since the Mediterranean fleet is in home waters for the coronation review. But John Collis spoke an hour or two ago to a chief friend who had been listening to the coronation service and who gave this typical reaction. Yes, I've been listening all day. In fact, we all have. And at noon in the mess, we all toasted her. All glasses were raised and our thoughts really went out to her in London when we spoke the toast. And now Africa. Throughout the vast continent today, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth has been acclaimed in an amazing diversity of ways. Some of them are familiar to listeners here, others will seem strange and exotic. A few hours ago, we had this report from Nairobi, from Ian McDougall, who says that coronation day there began with a march past of soldiers, sailors and airmen, watched by a great crowd made up of people from all sections of Kenya's population, European, African and Asiatic. 
Loud applause was continuous, drowned only by the roar of jet fighters of the Royal New Zealand Air Force. It was, however, a sign of Kenya's present troubles that only ten men of the Kenya Regiment and none of the King's African Rifles could take part in the parade, as the rest were absent on active service. But away from the city, numbers of loyal Kikuyu listened to the proceedings in London on specially distributed coronation radio sets, and throughout the colony there were sports and ceremonial gatherings. If the march past was the most colourful celebration of the day, the most solemn centred round the cathedral with its state service, a service attended by men and women of all races and ages, united by the desire to join in prayer and rejoicing on this most auspicious occasion and to forget for a time the troubles of Kenya. deeper into Africa to northern Rhodesia, and a contrast indeed. From Lusaka come the notes of one of the two remaining talking drums in the territory. Across the lands that lie between us, we send praises of the old chief. That is the message of Chief Captain Pangus from the Solwezi tribe. <laughs> In southern Rhodesia, which in a month's time will celebrate its centenary of Cecil Rhodes, John Parry tells you about the special celebration in Harare. In the African township of Harare, thousands gathered to show their loyalty to the Queen and to pray for her. It was a scene which only Africa can provide. Under a huge awning were gathered civic and religious leaders of the African and European community. Spread far around sat the people in the blazing sun. The uniforms of African scouts and guides, their flags and their banners, the schoolgirls in green dresses, the Salvation Army all in white, and hundreds of African mothers, their babies tied on their backs and their heads covered with many huge scarves, created a brilliant picture. Into this picture stepped the scarlet-coated governor to tell the gathering the crown is a sign of the things towards which we are striving. Great things are happening this year in Central Africa, and I believe in years to come, your children will look back on 1953 as a year of great good fortune for the African people. Then the voices swelled out in the African national anthem, God bless Africa, and God save the Queen. From Accra, in the Gold Coast, comes a song sung by girls of Bishop's School, which is quaintly but loyally titled, O Thou Hedgehog. It is a title of great respect in the Gold Coast, because the hedgehog or por porcupine is so unapproachable. The song goes, O Thou Hedgehog, be up and doing, let the world see thy greatness.
Throughout the Union of South Africa, Europeans and Africans have been celebrating wholeheartedly. Robert Stimson says that in Johannesburg, a great meeting was held at Ellis Park Cricket and Football Ground, where the Mayor, Mr. M. Muller, read a loyal address to the Queen, and Isi Bongo, a visiting Zulu notable, declaimed this special hymn of praise, which is followed by the Zulu salute of Bayeti. Is Bongo the Queen Elizabeth with me? Queen Elizabeth II praises. Shine, O great female elephant, the greatest and the brightest comet in the world. Shine, you who are the top of the whole world, by those who know you and those who know you not. May you have the brightest luck equal to your fame. May you shine great daughter of great elephants of great retail. Of the festivities in Cape Town, Robert Stimson has this to say. Here in Cape Town, the winds of our southern winter held off today, and it's a perfect coronation weather. A few hours after sunrise, the mist covering Togo Mountain gave way to brilliant sunshine. It has, of course, been a public holiday here, and all day long, hundreds of families, European, African, Cape Colored, and members of the Indian and Malay community, have come into the center of the city to admire the street decoration and the tonight the illuminations of wind. Many Cape Town citizens began their day by attending the religious services that were held in St. George's Cathedral and other places of worship. Later, large crowds filled the Grand Parade for a military review of serving members of the Union Defense Forces and some hours afterwards for a civic parade of ex-servicemen. Between these ceremonies, many people hurried home to listen to a relay of the BBC broadcast of the coronation service. While the service was taking place in Westminster Abbey, a royal salute was fired from Signal Hill, which flanked Table Mountain. Another royal salute was fired in Cape Town Harbour by the Royal Navy's light cruiser, HMS Norilus, flagship of the South Atlantic Squadron. In Pakistan also, today has been a colourful national holiday. Listen to how they greeted the event in Karachi. Coronation Day dawns to a city bedecked with bunting, and on most buildings could be seen the national flag of Pakistan flying proudly alongside the Union Jack. In keeping with this great and memorable occasion, at 8 o'clock this morning, a service of prayer and thanksgiving of the combined churches was held at the picturesque Holy Trinity Church, set amidst extensive green lawns. Earlier in the morning, a long stream of cars could be seen wending their way to the church, carrying officials, diplomats, and many of the city's elite who had come to pay homage and offer their prayers for another Queen of England. In India, the Union Jack has been flying on government buildings beside the flag of India. In Ceylon, on great occasions, the Singhalese beat their drums of joy, as you can hear from this recording received from sunny Colombo, thousands of miles away, with a report from Vernon Abhisekara. When the chimes of midnight were heard over Colombo, thousands of merrymakers in hotels and nightclubs stood stock still. A brief silence, and then the band struck up God Save the Queen. It was the beginning of a new and historic day, the day of the coronation. When the last notes of the anthem faded out, crackers and fireworks signaled a return to gaiety and abandon, which went on till early morning.
Singapore, time is seven hours ahead of our own, and the greatest procession ever seen in the city wound its way through the streets on a hot oriental night, just about the time when our coronation ceremony ended. There were soldiers from the Commonwealth who met at a services club to send their greetings. Well, I've had a very good time indeed. The city is really marvellously decorated with flags, bunting, uh, lights, all this all sorts. Uh, it is a thing that you must see to believe. Um, I, yes, yes. Well, we, we've had a really good time here, and, well, goodness knows what it must be like in England. <laughs> yes, they must be having fun there too, but I assure you that in uh, Singapore, we are having a whale of a time, particularly at this Nappy Britannia Club. Well, gentlemen, uh, we know we are uh, having a good time and that sort of thing, but let for one moment let us be serious, and may I quite sincerely wish the Queen the very best of health and long may she reign. Yes, the Queen. The Queen. In far Hong Kong, there was another procession, a fabulous affair with Chinese crackers and the famous dragon dance. Let's hear what happened this afternoon from Curtis Heinsohn, direct from Hong Kong. In the afternoon, it was the Chinese turn to celebrate. This was the great event of the day. A salute to Her Majesty by the Chinese community in the form of a spectacular procession complete with dancing lions, stilt walkers, 50 decorated lorries, five Chinese fans, and one golden dragon, a splendid creature who was the star turn of the whole show. <laughs> Nowhere in the Far East has this coronation day been more significant than among men of the Commonwealth Division in Korea. To let us know how the troops were getting ready for the day, they sent us a heartening warm-up sing-song from the Commonwealth Division, and here to lead off are the Pipers of the Black Watch. And a few hours ago, direct from Korea, we received this report from Major Pines. Far Eastern Day in Korea, dawned at the front to the usual accompaniment of field guns and fighter bombers blasting away at enemy positions. But in some of the dugouts, there was an air of bustle and hurry as men dressed themselves in their neatest uniforms, polished their brasses, and hurried out to trucks, which were waiting to take them to the rear for a coronation parade. Gold and crimson banners, fashioned from army materials, flew from crown tip poles. And behind the saluting base, the flags of the five nations which make up the Commonwealth Division Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India stood out against the sky. Now, from the Commonwealth Division in Korea, we go south to the Commonwealth within the Commonwealth. Our course over the newest colony, Sarawa, in Borneo, where the Dayaks, once headhunters, were singing their traditional songs of salutation, southwards to Australia. When the coronation procession was passing through the streets of London, it was already night time down under. 
But throughout the day, the people of Australia, and the children too, have made this an occasion of high holiday. Let's hear this Round Australia report from Sydney. The churches throughout Australia have been thronged, and in many, the order of service followed very closely that of the coronation ceremony itself. At St Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney, for instance, the service had to be relayed to the adjoining town hall, as many who had queued up for seats in the cathedral couldn't get in. And it's been like that all over Australia. In Canberra, the federal capital, where the sun shone equally brilliantly, a short ceremony took place in front of Parliament House, and after a levee inside, the Governor-General took the salute from the steps of Parliament House as RAAF aircraft flew overhead and a 21-gun salute was fired. In Canberra this evening, there'll be a state banquet. Melbourne's main event in the morning was the ceremony of trooping the colour by the Royal Melbourne Regiment. And in the afternoon, the highlight was the Coronation Cup run at Flemington Racecourse. This evening, the city goes gay with miles of street illuminations and floodlighting and of square dancing in front of Victoria's Parliament House. In Queensland, Brisbane has planned four days of celebration, including a vice-regal levee, an army royal review, a Venetian carnival, and a coronation ball. In South Australia, West Australia, and Tasmania, the celebrations have been following much the same pattern. But perhaps the loneliest man in Australia is a drover in the desert of central Western Australia. He's walking 550 store cattle to the railhead 700 miles south of his home but he has his portable radio with him, so he's still able to join in the celebrations. In New Zealand, people have special cause for rejoicing. Coronation celebrations had started before it was dawn in London, for New Zealand is 11 hours ahead of it. In the midst of a public meeting held outside the Parliament buildings in Wellington, Mr Holyoke, the Deputy Prime Minister, made this dramatic announcement to the crowd. And now we will break into the normal program of this service. I'm able to announce that a new flash has just come through, advising us that the New Zealander, Hillary, has succeeded in conquering Mount Everest. And the bells of the New Zealand National War Memorial carry-on rang out. Perhaps the most dramatic place of all in the Commonwealth where Her Majesty has been saluted is Fiji. In this special report flown to us from there, Mr. Exon and Mr. Sanders explain how they could exchange a coronation handshake between two hemispheres. This is Fiji calling from the most easterly point of Her Majesty's realm, from the 180th meridian, which is exactly half a world away from Westminster. The rich and lovely island of Taviuni happens to lie across that meridian, the only land in the empire that does, and from there I am speaking, from a point near Wairiki, just above high water mark on a curving coral beach. A cloud-tipped mountain range rises sheer behind us, and groves of coconut palms march in line after cultivated line towards the foothills, their feathery fronds swaying lazily in a breeze that barely ruffles the amazingly blue waters below. That is a Fijian lally giving Greenwich the time pips from the exact antipodes, from some 13,000 miles away, from the other side of the world. And now, from the last inch of the Eastern Hemisphere, I am handing the microphone over to my neighbor across the meridian. And I am in the Western Hemisphere, at the last loneliest and certainly the loveliest foot of it. For me, too, the lally is sounding from the other side of the world, although it's only some 20 feet away. Had the geographers not swung the date line, where a day is gained or dropped as we change hemispheres, clear of Teviuni, that lally would be beating out tomorrow's time, and I should be speaking to you on a Monday, whereas an instant ago and a foot away, it was Tuesday. And but for that deliberate distortion of the date line, I should have been able to enjoy two coronation days on the one island. Now to the New World, a leap of 8,000 miles to the West Indies. When our people first went adventuring to sea, it was first to the West Indies they came. 
Here they founded the first of the colonies which tonight hail the Queen. Bermuda, lone, sentinel and ship-like in mid-Atlantic, Barbados and Jamaica, all have contributed to the rich diversity of the islands. Islands celebrating tonight in their own way. In Trinidad, for instance, the traditional home of the Calypso, there was a special coronation competition in honour of Queen Elizabeth. From Port of Spain, Trinidad, we received this offering, composed by Skipper. It is a grand occasion. The appointed time is now at hand. It is a grand occasion. The appointed time is now at hand. The coronation of Her Majesty in this blessed year, 1953, is a rare, rare royal festival. Jump up and play carnival. It's a rare, rare royal festival. English people back on all. It's a rare, rare royal festival. Play your mask, don't no stop at all. It's a rare, rare royal festival. Oh! And as the coronation night goes on, this incredible night on which so much of the world seems to be rejoicing, radio is able to bring you, by a bridging distance in a second, a story from the new world which is almost as exciting as that first discovery of Columbus. 3,000 miles from London, television viewers in Canada and the United States have been awaiting the arrival of the historic television film of the coronation with an unparalleled eagerness. These films, taken in London today, are already in the new world thanks to an enterprise truly worthy of the new Elizabethan age. Canberra jet bombers took off from London this afternoon, carrying the films and flying across the Atlantic at nearly 600 miles an hour, the first plane has already reached Canada. At Goose Bay in Labrador, the films were met by jet fighters of the Royal Canadian Air Force and flown on to television transmitters in Canada and the United States. For a direct report on this dramatic meeting, let's go over to Tom Sloan in Montreal. Well, this has been a day that's been simply packed with excitement. Here in Canada, we've all heard the stirring and moving ceremony of the coronation on our radios in the early morning. And now we're watching it on television. This modern miracle was the result of Operation Pony Express. And what ponies they turned out to be. Three RAF Canberras and all-weather jet fighters of the Royal Canadian Air Force have combined in a flight that has sparked the imagination of the world. When the first Canberra landed in Labrador, Norman McBain of the CBC was on hand to witness the handover of the films to the RCAF, and he recorded this interview. Well, the RAF Canberra just touched down a couple of moments ago, bearing that all-important coronation film for the entire North American continent. Standing with me at the moment is squadron leader Kenyon, who flew the Canberra and, of course, the TV film over to Canada, and Flight Lieutenant Phil Etienne, uh, who will continue with uh, Operation Pony Express and uh, complete the vital link between Goose Bay and Montreal. Now, first of all, squadron leader, tell us something about your trip. Oh, we had a very pleasant trip all together, and a small item of radio failure, but fortunately, we only need that when we get that, not here. So we were able to come straight on, and uh, I think we made fairly good time. About uh, what speed do you think your average, sir? I think about 510 or 520, but we'll have to work it out better when we got these things. Were you aided by winds, and what temperatures did you encounter? Oh, the temperatures were quite reasonable, about minus 50 or minus 55. And about what altitude were you flying? 48,000 feet. And on the whole, would you say it was a successful trip? Oh, very pleasant. I enjoyed every moment of it, except the radio failure of it. And where did that happen? Oh, that was over the... As we left the north coast of Ireland. And now that the film is here, I suppose you're ready to hand it over to your RCAF colleague, Flight Lieutenant Phil Etienne. How do you do? What about your portion of the trip? Now that Squadron Leader Kenyon has made this long, long haul, how long do you think it'll take you to get it down to Montreal? We plan to get those films down to Montreal in the Canadian public just as fast as we can. And I hope we can get just uh, on our course as fast as Squadron Leader Kenyon here. We won't be going as high as Squadron Leader Kenyon because our winds won't be any advantage up there. We'll be going about 17,000 feet or so, and in the neighborhood of 600 miles an hour. 
Uh, we won't have a cold temperature spot in the Canyon Head either. I think we'll have a little advantage there, a little warmer. We'll be flying a little lower than Squad Leader Canyon? Yes, we will. We'll be down around the 20,000 area, and uh, we should average around 600 mile an hour speed there. Well, I don't think we should hold this film up any longer. When it gets to Montreal, Operation Pony Express is completed uh, when a helicopter picks up the film and uh, takes it down to the Radio Canada building for a presentation on the air. Now for the United States side of this television story. Over to Leonard Mile in Washington. Citizens of this republic have been following the Coron Coronation Day celebrations from outside, like a boy pressing his nose against the window of a particularly exciting shop. Many were up early before breakfast to listen to the service coming from the abbey, and wishing they could do something to lend the least the bright and sunny weather here. The Abbey service was exceptionally clear and was relayed by some 2,000 American radio stations. And the Queen's own broadcast tonight was, if anything, even clearer and was heard by millions of people. But perhaps the major excitement for Americans has been the prospect of seeing the films and tele-recordings on the screens in their own homes before this joyous day ends. There have been hourly reports of the progress of that RAF camera to Labrador. Every effort has been made to get the films onto the American air as fast as possible. And in fact, the first fighter plane bringing the American films from Labrador onwards to Boston arrived about an hour ago. We watched on the screen the engineers rush out to snatch the wheels of film from the cockpit. And after a few moments of patient threading into projectors, we saw here the films taken in London this morning. In addition, two American networks have chartered private passenger planes converted them into flying laboratories and will be ready with completely edited hour-length programs to transmit before the day ends. And one of the American networks, in its eagerness to meet its rivals, even quietly arranged to get the private use of a Canberra of its own, which set off direct for America a couple of hours before that RAF bomber. But after two hours' flight, this Canberra developed trouble and have to turn back to England and the anxious competitors breathe again. The television pictures are now being shown at a huge reception in the British Embassy given by all the Commonwealth ambassadors and the administration leaders in Washington. But there's much more to the American Coronation Day than huge receptions and the complicated logistics of transatlantic television. And for a quieter picture of a New England community, we'll switch now to a small town in Connecticut and Alistair Cook. I slept last night in a revolutionary house, that is to say, a house that was built before the War of Independence. It was a white wooden house looking across a dipping green lawn to the noble rise of the Taconic Hills. In this house, British soldiers camped before they fought the men of Connecticut. I woke up this morning at 6.30 by a voice calling one of the family downstairs saying, come quick or it will all be over. I stumbled to the window and saw a red-winged blackbird hop across the lawn and skim off into a cloudless sky. And then the voices of the boys of Westminster rose, and I was down to hear the family, and with mournful looks they said, it has rained all night in London. So the children went off a little melancholy to school. Yesterday they took a vote at school to see whether the boys or girls were more excited about the coronation. Nobody won because more girls' hands went up, but the sulky boys knew more about the service and the uniforms and the titles. This morning I drove down the long Housatonic River and in 40 miles saw nobody but fishermen standing up to their waist. One had a radio on in his car and while the trout swam up into danger, the great and solemn warnings of the Archbishop of Canterbury rolled across the twink twinkling water. Through 120 miles of Connecticut you hear no more mention of the old animosities against Britain, though there are many silent reminders of it. You turn a lane of hickories and elms, and a street comes in marked Bullet Hole Road. We whisked through another small town. Under the route number was a hanging sign, Route 7. This town settled 1732, burned by the British 1781. At last we came down into Ridgefield, a beautiful town whose main street has two miles of gorgeous elms that spout like fountains, and the air heavy with the scent of fading lilac. And here I came across a tablet fixed long ago in a stone wall that encloses a park and solemn trees. 
This stone, I think, says more, more silently than all the newspaper editorials and the vast surmising and explanations of why Americans are so moved and excited by the coronation. Stuck in the grass plot beside it today were two flags. This tablet faces the main street and it says these words. In defense of American independence, at the Battle of Ridgefield, April 27, 1777, died eight patriots who were laid in this ground, companioned by 16 British soldiers, living their enemies, dying their guests. This is Alistair Cook talking from the Connecticut countryside and saying good night. Round the world and back again to London, to the hub of the empire. In Piccadilly Circus, a Canadian is talking over the scene with an Australian. Here are Bernard Braden and Wilfred Thomas. Hello, this is Bernard Braden, and here in the centre of London, in what someone once described as the abub of the universe... There's plenty of fun tonight, for Piccadilly Circus is all lit, um, illuminated. One cannot help but agree with Alistair Cook about an occasion such as this bringing our countries close together. I think when G.K. Chesterton first visited New York and was shown the great white way lit up at night, his only comment was, what a wonderful fairyland for people fortunate enough not to be able to read. Well, I'm afraid the Piccadilly Circus tends to be a little that way these days, but the important things here tonight are the occasion and the people. Right now, I'm going to ask Wilfred Thomas to tell you a little about the scene that we're looking down on right now. Uh, well, most, lo most Londoners have had a very long day, you know, and tonight it's chilly and damp, so there are not the crowds in Piccadilly Circus that have been seen on other nights of jubilation. There are lots of soldiers. You'd think they'd be spine-bashing by now, and there are balloons and paper caps and all the rest of it. And down there, you have a feeling of being in an enclosed space where everyone's jammed close, sharing an emotion. It's like being in a huge room at a family party. Piccadilly Circus is lighted, as usual, by the um, coloured electric advertising signs, the rocket shooting up, you know, and bursting into a, a sort of a cascade of coloured stars, the familiar illuminated clock face, the line of arrows shooting around the side of a building, but there are also, of course, the roses uh, illuminated and the drapes of Regent Street, a big portrait of Her Majesty in Shaftesbury Avenue, and the focal point, the central feature around which everything revolves, the statue of Eros, has been specially dressed up for the occasion. Round the base and the fountain are... Uh, white and green boards with uh, rather elegant motifs of crossed gilded palm fronds to protect Eros from climbers and I should think to protect the crowd from falling in the drink. And round the top of the hoarding there's a floodlit garden of roses and greenery and above that saw the slender golden rods of the cage. And inside the cage there he is, the god of love, balanced elegantly and shooting his arrow at the hearts of countless youngsters surrounding him. For this is a night for making friends. And above him, the curly canopy and the gay coronet, all lighted up with pretty coloured lights like gems. All around Eros, the crowds are clustering. I hope they're centrally heated. And they're creating a volume of sound compounded of all the dialects of Britain and half the languages of the world. Anything like this in Canada, Bernie? Well, no, I don't think I've ever seen anything like Piccadilly Circus in Canada. We have a Calgary stampede, of course. And I remember when I was a child, I used to go to potlatches in Lost Lagoon in Vancouver, but oh. never anything like this. Oh, what what about Australia? Oh, we have corroborees among the natives, but of course they're not allowed to drink. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> on New Year's Eve, we have a similar thing to this in uh, King's Cross, which is a similar sort of assembly point. But nothing happens much, no bands play, no orators, everybody enjoys themselves in their own individual way. It's something like this. You know, the thing that always amazes me most about these occasions in Piccadilly Circus, and uh, as a matter of fact, throughout the entire West End of London, is the way the pedestrians take over. On these occasions, cars just don't belong as far as they're concerned. The streets belong to them, and the cars have to get in where they can. Have you notice that? Yes, Bernie, and there's another thing, how quickly the place gets cleaned up. I came through here about six o'clock something, and there was a sort of a carpet of soggy old newspapers, but now everything's cleaned up completely, and even the... The barriers have been uh, packed up and they're ready to take away. Yeah, I noticed that. And I noticed, too, uh, actually leaving the coronation route today in the afternoon, they were already sending the wagons around to pick up the refuse and the litter, and they were doing a very effective job of it. Yes, well, that's about all we can tell you about the uh, site in Piccadilly Circus right now. Uh, as the night grows older, maybe there'll be more excitement on, but still it's a very gay site, and I wish you all were here to enjoy yourselves. This is Wilfred Thomas signing off from Piccadilly Circus. Now, the greatest firework display ever seen in Britain is beginning. Over to the Victoria Memorial outside Buckingham Palace to hear from Winford Vaughan Thomas.
And let me make it quite clear straight away that I'm not reporting from London. I'm reporting from a totally new, enchanted, entranced city, caught in a wonderful web of light. It's completely changed. I can't recognize any of the old landmarks. All I can see is Buckingham Palace. Yes, that's true, solid, before me, illuminated by all the light. That balcony with everybody, this enormous crowd jammed against the railings is still chanting, We want the Queen. But I turn and look over the dark outline of the trees of Green Park, and what do I see? A fantastic fairyland. Right down the mall, these lovely leaping arches of light, coronets floating free from all support, lovely globes of light, and oh, way right over the Thames, there it is! Listen to the crowd, the first gigantic burst of fireworks. Up, up, higher, higher go the rockets, blowing my adjectives apart. By heavens, I've emptied the whole dictionary today, but what have I got left to tell you about this? Higher, higher, right up into the sky they climb, they burst, they shatter themselves against the crowd. Great showers of light, red and yellow, blue, glowing green, come tumbling down over London town. This is the glorious climax to the coronation. And adding to the joy and delight, a great web of searchlights go probing against the clouds. Yes, those clouds are still there, but they've risen high enough. The rain's relented. There's no rain falling as it now. And the searchlights go probing against the crowd. And, and they probe in great white needles of light. And again, up go the rockets. Crack, burst, shower, light, green, blue, every single color in the whole rainbow. And now, let me look down as the rockets burst overhead upon this wonderful London crowd. It's poured against the railings of the palace, thousands and thousands upon people. And the most exciting skyrocket that I can tell you about are the lights of the cars trying to push their way through the crowd down the mall, seizing a last chance to look at these glorious splendors of London town. London has clothed itself anew in light for the coronation. And looking away as the rockets burst over the Thames, there's Big Ben, solemn, sober. Yes, we've lit up his dial, but he's going to strike just the same. And to the right, there are these strong towers of Westminster Abbey. The searchlights have caught them in a web of light. Yes, the Abbey flag. There are the strong, firm Western towers, the centre of all our thought and our emotion on this glorious coronation day. Up go the rockets. We all are now lifted high on that showering splendour of light. It's the glorious, scintillating climax to coronation day here in London town. Thus, Coronation Day is coming to an end. Here in London, the huge, cheering, warm-hearted crowd salutes the young queen as she stands on the balcony of her floodlit palace, while the fireworks make exciting arabesques of multicoloured light in the sky. It is the end of a day and the beginning of an age. Our queen whom most of us have watched blossom through simple childhood to royal state, is facing history and the destiny of all the peoples in our Commonwealth. Something of our hopes and prayers at this moment is told in a short poem to the Queen written by her poet laureate, John Macefield, and entitled, Lines on the Coronation of Our Gracious Sovereign. This lady whom we crown was born when buds were green upon the thorn and earliest cowslips showed. When still unseen by mortal eye, one cuckoo told his here am I. And over little glints of sky in rain pools whence the trickles flowed, the small snipe clattered wing. The swallows were upon the road, Naught but the cherry blossoms snowed, the promise was on all fields sowed of earth's beginning spring. (laughs) 
Now that we crown her as our queen, may love keep all her pathways green. May sunlight bless her days. May the fair spring of her beginning ripen to all things worth the winning, the very surest of our praise that mortal men attempt. May this old land revive and be again a star set in the sea, a kingdom fit for such as she, with glories yet undreamt.